Hello, it's Scott Manley here. As we head into the new year, everybody has been talking about the star Beetlejuice and how it has become uncharacteristically dim. In fact, its brightness is the lowest it has been for over a century. Its magnitude right now is 1.29. So Beetlejuice is a variable star, it changes brightness over time, it's also a red giant that is more or less at the end of its lifetime. The stars become red giants after they burn through the hydrogen in their, in their main sequence and start burning other elements. Uh, so Beetlejuice is expected to become a supernova at some point. Uh, so anyway, big changes in the brightness make people think that this might be happening sooner rather than later, and that's why a lot of people rushed out videos maybe, because they thought it might explode really soon. I, on the other hand, have spent a little more time studying stellar evolution, I think that it, it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. Most astronomers would love to see this event. A, a supernova within 1,000 light years of Earth would be um, would be fantastic. I mean, the closest supernova that has been observed by humans was the uh, 1054 supernova, which created the Crab Nebula, and that's about 6,500 light years away. But most astronomers don't think Betelgeuse will go supernova for tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand years. The thing is, astronomers don't get to decide. I, I mean, astronomy is kind of unique as a scientific discipline since there's no experiments, just observations. We can't even change the, the camera angle. So while most astronomers agree that it's probably not going to explode anytime soon, there is a huge amount of disagreement on how you actually pronounce it. Is it Betelgeuse? Is it Betelgeese? Uh, the name actually originates in Arabic, and as one of the brightest stars in the sky, part of the Orion constellation, it was given a name based upon its perceived part of the great mythical hunter. So it was apparently, possibly, the armpit of Orion, Ibit al Jiza, or it was possibly Yid al Jiza, Hand of Orion. These names were given by Arabic scholars while Europe was in the Dark Ages, and then during the Renaissance, when learning became important again, the uh, Arabic knowledge of stars was brought back to Europe and transcribed by people that didn't speak Arabic very well. So we end up with Betelgeese or Betelgeuse or whatever. Its Bayer designation, right, is Alpha Orionis, meaning that it is the brightest star in Orion. And the blue giant, Rigel, which is down near in the bottom right corner, that's Beta Orionis, suggesting that it's the second brightest star in the constellation. But the problem with this is that, on average, Rigel is actually brighter than Betelgeuse. So that name isn't quite right either. And for those of you wondering, Betelgeuse would have to get another 0.35 magnitudes fainter to be comparable to the third brightest star, which is Bellatrix. And you know, if we're talking about the brightest stars, if you could see in the infrared, then Betelgeuse would actually be the brightest star in the night sky, outshining even Sirius. Betelgeuse also has the distinction of being the widest star in the night sky in terms of its angular diameter. Astronomers have known this for a long time because it's very, very red, and red stars have lower per area luminosity. So therefore, to get the same brightness as all those other, you know, zeroth magnitude stars, it must have a wide area on the sky. So when astronomers were trying to find stars that they could measure the diameter of, that was always the first place they went. And they finally measured the diameter back about 100 years ago. It was an experiment by Michelson and Pease. And they set up an interferometer where they could adjust the, the aperture on their uh, telescope, essentially, and made it wider and wider until the interference patterns changed, showing that they were wide enough to actually resolve the disk of the star. And they came up with a measurement that was like 55 milli arc seconds. But of course, since then, telescopes have got bigger and better, and Betelgeuse was the first star where we were able to image the surface and see hot spots on its photosphere. And here's where I sort of need to set some expectations. A lot of people think of Betelgeuse or red giants as being like the sun, but way bigger and way redder. And the thing with red giants is their outer atmospheres have puffed up because of the energy being produced in the small, tiny, degenerate core. The outer atmosphere is a very small a fraction of the mass of the star. It is a boiling, turbulent mess of convection zones rising and falling. It's more like a giant, red, angry crowd, cloud. And when I say giant, Betelgeuse is about 1.5 billion kilometers across based on its distance estimates. 
If Betelgeuse was at the centre of our solar system, it would have engulfed every planet out to and including Jupiter. The exact size isn't totally certain because the distance isn't totally certain. Uh, we measure the distance to Betelgeuse by its parallax. That's how much it wobbles back and forth as the Earth moves around the Sun and changes the viewpoint. So back when Michelson and Pease did their experiment, the best measurements suggest that it wobbled by 18 milliarc seconds, which you'll notice is smaller than the 55 milliarc second diameter. And that corresponds to a distance of about 200 light years. But since then, technology's improved, measurements have got better, and right now it looks like the distance is about 650 light years, but there's still very big error bars on this. Because the surface is so turbulent, the effect of temperature of the star is hard to pin down as well. We get temperatures anywhere from 3250 to 3700 Kelvin. And that, of course, feeds back into figuring out the other characteristics. Because Betelgeuse isn't part of a binary system, there's no direct way to measure its mass. So its mass is guessed by looking at where it fits on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram is a very powerful tool in astronomy. Astronomy hasn't been around for long enough to actually see a main sequence star evolve and turn into a red giant. But we know this happens because we've observed hundreds of thousands of other stars, and we've been able to plot their uh, luminosity and their color, and we observe these patterns from uh, things like clusters where they were all born at roughly the same time, and so you can see that around a certain age, they all disappear off and become red giants. So combining this observation with models, let's us figure out roughly where Betelgeuse fits on this diagram. And so we know that it probably is about 19 to 20 solar masses. And therefore we know that it is big enough to undergo a core collapse supernova. So the models suggest that Betelgeuse formed maybe 10 million years ago. It collapsed into a bright blue main sequence star, a B-type star with a diameter maybe 8 to 9 times that of the Sun, luminosity maybe 30,000 times of the, that of the Sun, and surface temperature maybe 30,000 Kelvin. In this phase, the star burns hydrogen to helium in the core of the star. This phase lasts for about 10 million years until all the hydrogen in the core is exhausted. The core then collapses down until the temperatures get high enough for the helium to start fusing. And at that point, you have roughly a 1 million year helium burning phase where it converts helium into carbon and oxygen. In this phase, the core has actually collapsed down and the energy production has increased. So the star's outer layers puff up and you get initially you get a blue giant and then eventually becomes a red supergiant that we see today. But after the helium in the core is exhausted, things happen very quickly. Carbon will burn to produce neon amongst other things. That phase will last maybe 2,000 years. After that, the neon will burn into oxygen and that will only last maybe five years. Then the oxygen, that burns into silicon, and that lasts perhaps four months. Finally, that silicon burns to nickel for a final week of fusion-powered fight against the forces of gravity. Once that's gone, there's no more energy left to resist against gravity. So the core collapses down, the protons and the electrons get close, and they get crushed to form neutrons. That releases neutrinos, and those neutrinos pile into the outer layers of the star, blowing it off in one a stunning release of energy. And yes, that would be pretty darn spectacular from Earth. At its current distance, it would probably be about as bright as the full moon. It would be visible in daylight for maybe a month or two afterwards, and it would shine in the sky for a couple of years. It wouldn't be any threat to anyone on Earth. Certainly, I uh, don't think there's anything to worry about there. Uh, of course, you know, you might find that some species that navigate by the moon might be confused for a little while, but these species have been around long enough that they've experienced this in their evolutionary past, so I think they'll survive. I mean, the interesting thing is that we can very accurately predict the results of what will happen when it happens. We just can't predict when it will happen, because it's we're really not sure of the exact makeup of the star. We're not sure how long it's been this in this state or how long it has left to go. Some of the ways that we look at the, the age is we examine the way that it has lost material. It's been blowing off material as off its uh, envelope into space, and we can actually see this. 
There's a, another thing that we can see is as it's moving through space, Betelgeuse is actually a runaway star. It's moving at about 30 kilometers per second, which is higher than most of your, your average stars. And as it moves through space, it's actually making a shockwave in the interstellar medium. And the formation of that shockwave actually happened relatively recently. So there's one argument that the transition from the blue giant to the red supergiant phase is what is linked to the onset of this new shockwave. Uh, and that gives them an age of something like 30,000 years that it transitioned into this larger state. So that still gives us plenty of time. This whole phase is actually critically important to galactic evolution because right now it's throwing off material that has been fused and this is going to seed the creation of planets and stars for future generations. So even though the brightness change has set new records for the star, it's unlikely that this is any harbinger of large-scale changes in the near future. I wouldn't go betting any money on this thing exploding anytime soon. And even if it doesn't, it's still one of the most fascinating objects in the night sky. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. Fly <laughs> safe.